so up to this point we have seen that there is a central ALU, right, the logical or arithmetic and logic unit that performs computations, right. And in association with that, there is some kind of a memory block that stores the data and perhaps the operations that need to be performed, okay. Now, the real world kicks in, right. Physics comes into the picture and what it, it says is, if I have a small amount of memory, right, that needs to be connected, it's not a problem because all that will happen is there will be a few wires that need to be connected from this memory to the ALU, okay. There will be some kind of gates that are required in order to take the address that I'm interested in and actually figure out which value in this memory needs to come out, right. So, there is something called address decoding, right. So, address decoders could be fairly small provided that my memory itself is small and I can probably get by with relatively small gates or more importantly a small number of gates, right. So, it is not so much about small gates. Once again, the term gates for those of you who have not yet done a course on digital logic, those are the in some sense the fundamental building blocks of how we are building up this entire digital circuit that can do this job for us, okay. Now, intuitively it would be fairly clear that when something is compact, small, there is a good chance it is also fast, right. It is easy to build, it all fits within a small space, the sort of you know wiring lengths are relatively short, the capacitances or the you know uh, current required to charge up any uh, part of uh, the you know, different circuitry to different voltages is going to be small, okay. And such a circuit if I can build it is probably going to be quite fast, okay. What exactly does fast mean? Once again, this is being used in a very loose sense, right. In order to really understand what we mean by fast, you need to start getting into the details of how this thing is actually going to be operated. For now, all that we need to think about is, when we say fast, compared to human thought, which occurs in the, you know, time scales of milliseconds or tens of milliseconds or even more than that, this is several orders of magnitude faster right. It is quite easy to come up with these kind of circuits that operate on the time scales of microseconds, more importantly or much more commonly in the time scales of nanoseconds, right. So, it could be like 3 to 6 orders of magnitude faster than what the human brain is working at. But that is it, right. The kind of operations it is doing are fairly simple. It is just able to add 2 numbers or multiply 2 numbers together, right. And it is quite clear that the human brain is doing something else. It is not just adding numbers together. We do not quite know exactly what it does or how exactly it does the processing, but it does not really make sense to compare the two beyond a point. All that we can say for sure is if we do need to add two numbers together, this computer would be able to do it much faster than the human brain could, okay. So far so good. And even in the context of, you know, uh, digital circuits, clearly having a small circuit intuitively it seems obvious why that would be quite fast, okay. Now, what if I wanted to increase the amount of memory, right? Why would I want to do that? Simple, I want to have more instructions, more data, right? I want to write a larger program which performs more computations for me, right? If such a thing happens as we can imagine, the wiring starts to get a little bit more complex. Right? Now, it is no longer so easy to get that same, you know, the connection from all of these things into this ALU. The number of wires becomes more and possibly, you know, any kind of decoding that I need to do in order to figure out where in the memory I need to either read from or write to, that also starts to get a bit more complicated, okay. The area of whatever chip you are building to do this is naturally going to increase simply because, well, you know, this memory is going to become larger. But not only that, even these wires are going to start occupying a lot more space. What usually happens when something becomes larger is that it also becomes slower, right. And naturally at this point what we are seeing is that the memory starts to become slower than the operational unit, okay. What I mean by the operational unit is the ALU out here. So, the ALU is still something relatively small. All that is doing is taking two numbers, adding them or multiplying them and so on together. 
but this memory is starting to expand, right? I want to store more and more stuff in it, but that means that it's getting more complicated, right? And it starts to become slower. And is there any practical limit to where we would want to go? That's not so obvious, right? There is every reason why I might want to consider having a really large program, okay? And what would a large program mean? It would essentially mean a long sequence of operations, right? Which is perfectly understandable because, you know, I might want to model larger and larger systems, perform more computations, any number of reasons why I might want to do that, right? This becomes physically harder to make. I mean, I, you, know, you can already see that, well, obviously I would need to figure out a different way of constructing it. I don't want it to become a thin long line like this. Maybe I could break it up, you know, rearrange it in some kind of a better rectangle or like closer to a square kind of a shape and so on. All that is good and in fact it's done. The problem is it doesn't make it any faster. In fact, it usually becomes really difficult to make something that is going to operate really fast, right? While also being able to handle this level of complexity. So, speed is going to be a major casualty out here, right? The memory rapidly gets to the point where, yes, it is capable of storing a large amount of information, but it is also going to be significantly slower than what the ALU is capable of handling, right? What do we do about this, right? Does it basically say that, you know, there's a limit to how big my memory can be? And that's it, you can't run programs bigger than this, okay? That doesn't seem like a very useful conclusion, Right? So, we obviously want to find a way around it. One way to look at it would be, okay, I have this large memory that is capable of storing huge operating sequences, which basically means large programs and huge amounts of data. And I have my ALU, my computational unit that remains the same as before, right? It's capable of taking two inputs at a time and performing a computation. The problem that happened was linking these two together. Right? That turned out to be a major bottleneck because this, there was a speed mismatch. I can't sort of get both of them working the same way. The trick that's used in order to get around that is to say, let me break this up. Right? I'm going to create one small amount of memory and put this into close connection with my ALU. Right? So anything that's sitting in this small amount of memory out here is very quickly accessible from my ALU, okay? And I'll be able to perform all my operations, my plus, star, whatever it is that I want to perform directly with the data that is sitting inside this small block of memory. I essentially think of it as a temporary memory, right? Why I'm saying temporary memory is because it's small. I can't really use it for storing everything that I need for the program, right? What I do instead is whenever I need to, I pull in some data from my main memory into my temporary memory. And once I'm done with that, whatever computation I've performed, I push it back to free up some space in my temporary memory. Pull in new data, okay? Because I know that the actual data that I'm dealing with is always going to be stored safely out here. It means that anything that is stored in this temporary memory is temporary. It can be discarded as required. Okay. In fact, what is usually done in practice is we go one step further. We don't just think of it as a temporary memory. We don't think of it as, you know, just an address and then only one of those values can be read out at a time. We usually refer to these things as something called registers. Okay. So the registers are a form of temporary memory. They essentially are very closely tied to the ALU, right? They are capable of storing only a small amount of data because if I start having too many registers, I run into all the problems that I was trying to avoid, right? But they are fast. Anything that is stored in a register is immediately accessible to the ALU. The ALU is capable of performing any kind of arithmetic operation pretty much in one clock cycle, so to say, right? And one clock cycle, right? Once again, this is something which depends heavily on the digital logic implementation that underlies all of this. We assume that there is some kind of a clock, something that's ticking away and telling us, you know, run, 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 do things fast, right? And that clock, the faster it runs, obviously the better. And eventually our goal is that 
whatever it is that the ALU is trying to perform should happen within a single tick of the clock, right? What usually happens when we have a large memory is that getting data from this large memory into the CPU or the ALU in a single clock may simply not be possible. It just ends up taking too much time. But what we could do is pull in some data, keep it over here, perform a whole bunch of computations in the registers and once we are done with that, push the data out. Right? So typically what we would have is this register block would have maybe the capacity to store a few tens of values, maybe 10 values, maybe around 20 to 30 values, something like that, but not much more. Okay? The memory on the other hand could easily store thousands, millions or today even billions of values. Right? So when you say that your computer has, for example, 4 gigabytes of memory, right? what you are literally saying is that it has 4 billion 8-bit values that can be stored in the memory. Right? Whereas the number of registers that we have typically would probably be around 30 or so right? in a typical processor. Right? So we have figured out a way whereby this huge amount of memory can be brought in to the registers temporarily, you perform the computation, push the results back into main memory and then basically clear up whatever is there in your registers. You don't care what happens to it after that because you have already saved it somewhere. Okay. So this block which basically combines the ALU and the registers is usually what we refer to as the CPU, the central processing unit and in some sense is the core of your computer. Okay? When you say, when you, you know, look at your laptop and it says that it's a quad core machine, it basically means that it has four such units, four ALUs plus their corresponding registers, right? And that's of course a huge oversimplification because it also has a bunch of other logic that helps it to do things fast. But in purely in terms of functionality, that's all there is to it, right? There is one unit out there that's capable of performing computations and there is some temporary storage that allows that unit to work. Everything else is outside the computer, outside the CPU, okay? And putting all of those together is what gets us to the point where we have a full-blown computer. But this CPU core essentially consists of just functionality plus some registers in order to store the temporary data. Okay, so now we have seen that the CPU has functionality, the ALU and registers, and this memory could be very large, right? So clearly there has to be some way by which I can pull data from that memory into the CPU or push data back out from the CPU into the main memory, right? The pulling data is usually referred to as a load. What we say is we load data, load numbers, load values, whatever it is, from the main memory into the registers inside the CPU. And similarly, we can store data back from the CPU into the main memory. Okay? Load and store, once again, terms that you are very likely to come across as you proceed with your understanding of computers or with programming in general, right? We very often talk about loading a value from main memory into some kind of registers and performing computations with them. When we are using a programming language like C, we are usually working at a slightly higher level of abstraction, which means we don't need most of the time to be concerned about the distinction between memory and registers. But C is an interesting language. It is close enough to the hardware that you might at some point actually need to know the difference. Okay? And if you do come across these terms load and store, this is essentially what it's talking about. right? There is some memory that is large and you need to load parts of that into the registers of the CPU, perform computations and store the results back.